In the last lecture, we saw how externalities can lead to market failures. In these cases, the market might not know best, and perhaps there is a role for government. So what can a government do to address these market failures? One option a government has is regulation. If the government knows what the social optimal outcome is, the government can just impose it. Let's go back to our steel plants example from last lecture. Every ton of steel produced results in a $10 negative externality for fishermen whose fish are dying off from the plant sludge. Suppose in this example, the steel plants would produce 500 tons of steel if left to their own devices. But if the negative externality on the fishermen is taken into account, the socially optimal amount of steel to produce is only 450 tons. In that case, the government could just tell the steel plants they can only produce 450 tons of steel. End of story. The problem with this seemingly straightforward solution is that it requires the government to know a lot. To figure out the right quantity, the government would need to know the supply and demand curves for steel, and then it would need to figure out the right quantity to produce given the externality. In practice, this is difficult. But the government has another, less difficult option, taxation. It turns out that all the government needs to know is the size of the negative externality. Then the government just imposes a tax of that size on the source of the externality, and we get the socially optimal outcome. We call this corrective taxation. In the steel plants example, the market price without government action was $100 per ton of steel. So the plants produced until their marginal cost is equal to $100 per ton. And we saw this result in an overproduction of steel since the plants ignored the $10 per ton externality on the fishermen. What if the government imposed a $10 per ton tax on the steel plants? What would this do to the plant's production decision? Well, it raises the plant's marginal cost by $10 per ton of steel. To maximize profits, the plants will now want to produce until marginal cost equal to $110, not $100 as before the tax. And that's exactly the point where the government wants the steel plants to produce. $110 is the social marginal cost of producing a ton of steel. And now the government has used its tax authority to make $110 the private marginal cost of the plant as well. Remember that social marginal cost is just private marginal cost plus any externality. So adding that externality to the private marginal cost gets the steel plants to bear the full social cost of their steel production. As a result, the steel plant produces the right amount of steel. Corrective taxation has fixed the externality problem, and all the government had to know was the level of the externality. So to get regulation right, governments need to know the supply and demand curves and the level of the externality. To get taxation right, governments just need to know the level of the externality. So why do most government interventions to protect the environment involve regulation that restricts quantities, like bans on dangerous substances or limits on pollution allowed, rather than taxation that changes costs? One reason is that sometimes the externality is so bad that the government just doesn't want to take any chances. For example, 50 years ago, almost all indoor paints had lead added to them to speed up drying and increase durability. Lead is toxic, and if you eat lead paint, it can cause nervous system damage, stunted growth, and delayed development. Doesn't sound like something anyone would want to eat, right? Well, it turns out that lead paint chips tend to be colorful and taste sweet. And there's a group of people who have a hard time not eating colorful sweet things, little kids. Lead paint in homes can, and in fact did, have horrible effects on young children. So the US government banned lead in paint in 1977. The externality of damaging the development of children was too consequential to simply tax. The government felt that it had to regulate by banning lead paint altogether. As we think about more and more examples of externalities, we begin to see how widespread they are and how much scope there is for possible government intervention. For example, there are many environmental externalities that affect our air, land, and water. The most important of these in the long run is global climate change. There are also many health externalities, whereby one individual's decisions may affect the health or safety of others. We talked earlier about one example, cigarettes. Another example is alcohol. When someone drinks, that person potentially imposes externalities on others in a number of ways. One of the most tragic is drunk driving. If a driver drinks, resulting in a crash that hurts or even kills someone else, that's a huge negative externality. 
Every day in the U.S., 30 people die in drunk driving accidents at an annual cost of almost $60 billion. Drinking is also associated with higher rates of crime. These crimes impose large negative externalities as well. In the U.S., 25% of crime and 40% of domestic abuse cases involve victims who report that the perpetrator had been drinking before committing the crime. How does the government deal with alcohol? With a mix of regulation and taxation. In the U.S., the government bans drinking completely for use and taxes it for everyone else. In addition to environmental and health externalities, externalities can also be found in the banking, real estate, and education sectors, among others. Externalities in all of these spheres help explain the variety of roles governments play around the world.